I want you to imagine the President of the United States is coming to dinner at your house. It's a big deal. The President in your house. However, there's one small problem. He's from the other political party. And even though you didn't vote for him, you enjoy the attention. The president coming to your house elevates your status. Everyone who's anyone is invited. It's a major event. The whole town shows up. The media are crowded on your lawn. Everyone wants to see the president. People start arriving at your house an hour before the president arrives. You hired a butler to answer the door. Everyone is greeted and announced when they enter. The night is full of ceremony because the president is coming and you're the lucky host. But something in you just can't cross the political aisle and pretend you like this president. So you decide this is your chance to make a statement, show everyone what, what you really think. You'll show the president who's boss. The motorcade arrives, motorcycles and limos. The president steps out of his limo, walks up the front walk, and onto the porch, he rings the doorbell, and no one answers. You've already sent the butler home. You hear the doorbell, but you decide to make the president wait. Everyone assembled outside is watching. Finally, after he rings the doorbell the third time, you send your daughter, who just got done playing with slime, to the door. The president is greeted by a slime-covered hand, and you yell from the kitchen, come on in, sit down anywhere. The president sits down on the couch next to your poodle. No one greets him or offers him anything to drink. Your friend walks in and says, hey, buddy, shoes off in this house. That carpet's only 18 months old. When it's time to eat, you take your seat at the head of the table, surrounded by the movers and shakers of the community. It's your, it's your night. It's your big chance to impress people. Meanwhile, the president is seated at the kid's table with your four-year-old son and his three friends, Iggy, Stinky, and Spanky, who have started a burping contest. The president isn't joining the contest. You serve the other guests first, and you finally get the president. There isn't any bread left. Most of the food is cold. You don't ask what he wants. You just plop a pile of cold mashed potatoes and a piece of roast on a paper plate because the good china is at the adult table. Everyone in the house, everyone gathered outside, everyone watching on TV sees the way you treat the president. Everyone knows you're purposely ignoring him, but no one tries to fix it. You prove that you're not gonna treat this president special. You use the occasion of his visit to publicly ridicule and humiliate the president of the United States. That's kind of the setting of the story in Luke chapter seven. Simon, a Pharisee, invited Jesus to his house, but not because he wanted to honor Jesus. Instead, Simon wanted to illustrate to the entire town just how important he was and how unimportant Jesus was. It started at the door. Everyone was greeted with a warm embrace, but Jesus was ignored. Next, a servant washed the dust from the road off the feet of each guest, but when Jesus walked in, the servant ignored him. Simon watched and laughed. He's thinking, we'll show him. He thinks he's big stuff, but he's not big stuff here. That's where we pick up the story. Luke 7, 36, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house, reclined at the table. The Pharisees were the religious authorities of the day. They knew a lot about God, but they didn't know God. The Pharisees were all about rules and regulations. They didn't like Jesus because Jesus didn't care about their rules and their traditions. Jesus focused on lost people more than religious people. Jesus wasn't stupid. He knew why they invited him there and how he would be treated. So why did he go? Why did Jesus go to the house of his enemies? Jesus went to the place where he was hated because he knew the most unlikely person in town needed to be accepted and forgiven. 
When a woman who'd lived a sinful life in that town, everyone in town knew she was a sinner. In fact, history tells us she was a prostitute. Everyone knew about her past. She was that kind of person. Do you have a past? I mean, I know everyone has a past, but is there something you did or something that was done to you that affects the way you think and act? Is there something in your past that affects your self-worth, the way you see yourself? Maybe you did something, you've kept the secret. You don't want anyone to know. You're worried if people knew, they wouldn't accept you. You're not even sure God can see beyond your past. One weekend, I met a 19-year-old girl in the lobby. I could tell that she was nervous and uncomfortable, and I tried to make small talk, but it wasn't going very well. And finally, tired of trying to find something to talk about, I just asked her, what brings you here? And her answer was direct. She said, I'm pregnant, and I'm looking for a church that won't condemn me. I was told I'm not welcome anymore at the church where I grew up. A few weeks later, I got a message from a student who was struggling with sin issues. He said, I, I want to come back to church. I just want to know, are you going to condemn me? Uh, are, you, are you still willing to accept me? Will you allow me to come back? Isn't it sad people have to ask? This is the one place they shouldn't have to fear being judged and rejected. They should be able to bring their hurts, their sins, and their past to church and receive acceptance and forgiveness. But if you have a past, it's a real fear. Will people condemn me or will people accept me? You might even wonder, will God accept me or will God condemn me? Some of you have a lifelong struggle with self-condemnation. Your mistakes Sins and failures have colored the way you see yourself. You feel worthless, ashamed, forgotten, empty, rejected, afraid, and alone because of your past. Well, if you've got a past that you can't get past, today's your day. I want you to listen close while I share the story of one woman who is rejected by society because of her past and her sinful lifestyle. When a woman who'd lived a sinful life in that town learned Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. She brought a small jar that contained a very expensive mix of oil and spices. That perfume probably represented her life savings. Think in terms, modern day, about $30,000. The jar was a one-time use jar when you, to open it, you had to break it. And once you opened it, that was it. It was open and gone forever. It was the kind of thing a woman kept for her wedding night. Well, somehow this woman learned Jesus was going to be there and decided to see him no matter what. She knew she wasn't supposed to be there. She wasn't welcome. She certainly wasn't invited. She, she wasn't supposed to touch Jesus because if a sinner like her touched Jesus, he would be considered unclean. But she'd heard about Jesus' teaching, his views. Jesus attended a banquet at Matthew's house where he ate with sinners and tax collectors. Maybe she heard what Jesus said when he was questioned about spending time with sinners, with those kind of people. When they questioned him, Jesus answered, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. She fit the bill, a sinner. She was a prostitute. But if there was ever a chance... If there was ever someone who could truly love her, if there was ever someone who could truly accept her, it was Jesus. He was her last chance. He was her only hope. She wanted to meet him, but every time she asked, the response was the same. You're crazy. You can't go see Jesus. No one wants to be seen in public with a woman like you, especially him. No, 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 you're not qualified to be around Jesus. Jesus claims he came for sinners, but you're too far gone. 
There's too much in your past. You have way too much sin to come to Jesus. You're so bad, even Jesus can't love you. Jesus wouldn't risk being seen with you, talking to someone like you. Everyone knows what you've done. Even if you decide to change, no one would believe it. You're trouble. You've always been trouble. You'll always be trouble. Even the other prostitutes told her, get real. You can't go see Jesus. He's not going to be seen with you. If you really want to change, move far away where nobody knows about you. Her family had given up on her years ago. They were too ashamed to claim her. To them, she might as well be dead. The last thing the Pharisees wanted was a prostitute at their party because they were way too good for people like her. No doubt, there were men in that room who had used her. They had several thoughts when she approached Jesus. First, they hoped she wouldn't say something to them. They pretended not to see her. Second, they, they knew she was about to make a fool out of herself because people like her couldn't go to Jesus. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you've ha even had religious people say similar words. Maybe you've gone to church and like the woman with that alabaster jar, you saw people you've sinned with. They were at the same parties. You drank together. Maybe you stole money from the same company. You told lies and gossiped. They know exactly what they've done. And even though they're guilty too, they're, they're way better at putting on a good face than you are. I wish the Bible told us what this woman was thinking at that moment. Her heart had to be pounding. What if he rejects me? What if all this is for nothing? What if he publicly rebukes me? What in the world was I thinking? They know what I am. People can't, like me can't go to Jesus. But through it all, somehow she knew my only chance is Jesus. I've messed up my life. There's no other hope. I'm going to see Jesus. She didn't come in a group. She was on her own. It's a picture of an incredibly bold, desperate woman. Life her way had been a total disaster. She had to see Jesus. And I think, this is not the Bible, I think she planned and practiced what she was going to say. I think she had a speech ready. Jesus, I, I know I'm not a good person. I know there's no reason for me to be loved and forgiven. I've messed up so many times. I admit it. I've done wrong. I'm a prostitute. Please, is there any hope for me? But when she got to Jesus, the words wouldn't come. She was overwhelmed. She felt something she'd never felt before. It, it wasn't lust, someone wanting to use her. It was pure, beautiful love. She couldn't say a word. Instead, as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them, and she broke open that alabaster jar and poured perfume on his feet. She hadn't cried in front of people in years. She didn't want to admit her pain, but now all that hurt and pain and all the shame came pouring out on the feet of Jesus as she knelt and wept in front of the suddenly silent crowd. You can understand her tears. To come to Jesus, this woman faced rejection. What if Jesus didn't love her? What if she'd done too much to be forgiven? She'd been rejected many times. If Jesus rejected her, she'd be humiliated all over again. She faced criticism. The whole town was watching. No one wanted her in the room and no one wanted her near Jesus. She risked having to change. If Jesus did accept her, what would she have to change? What would that look like? Could someone like her really change? She was overwhelmed with shame. She realized all she'd done. And now she felt the disapproving stares of the men around her. She was ashamed of her past. She was ashamed of her sin. She was ashamed of who she was. 
She was filled with desperation and fear. This was her last and only chance. If this didn't work, the Pharisees would never forgive her for breaking up their party. If the night went wrong, it could cost her life. She knew all that. So filled with emotion and fear and desperation in front of the whole party, she knelt at the feet of Jesus and she wept. Can you imagine the emotion and the tension? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Jesus didn't look away. Jesus didn't treat her with disgust or disdain or push her away. Instead, Jesus saw her. And he sent a powerful message of value to someone who desperately needed to know that she mattered. When she began to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and pour perfume over them, Jesus loved and accepted her. Jesus treated her like she was special, like she was worthy of his time and attention. And when the Pharisees who'd invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of a woman she is. She's a sinner. And Jesus answered him. Now, I want you to make sure you notice this. He said to himself means he thought it. Okay, this is not like you when you talk to yourself. He thought it. And somehow... Jesus knew what this man thought. Jesus answered his thoughts with a story and a question. Remember, the whole time, this woman is still kneeling at his feet, crying. Jesus said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Simon said, tell me, teacher. And you know, it's pretty sarcastic. Jesus said, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which one will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. It's not the size or the amount of your sin that matters. Big or little, the amount you need to be forgiven is irrelevant to Jesus. When you approach Jesus, he simply loves and forgives. Then he turned toward the woman, and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, the traditional greeting, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but here she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. You look at someone in church, and you wonder, why are they so excited? Why are they raising their hands and crying? Why is she dancing? Why does she shout? What's that all about? They are expressing their love and their gratefulness in response to Jesus' forgiveness. Amen. The more you've been forgiven, the greater your demonstration and your expression of love.
And though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard. As she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. So I've come to pour my praise on him like oil and very alabaster box so don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair because mm -hmm. you weren't there the night he found me you did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. No one knows what you've been through. I can't forget the way life used to be Cause I was a prisoner To the scene that had me bound I spent my days Poured my life without measure Into a little treasure box I thought I'd find should all love like that because the regardless of the size of our sin the results the same unless we are forgiven that sin keeps us from an eternity with God in his presence and then Jesus looked again at the woman at his feet and he said to her your sins are forgiven and the other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? There it was again, the whispers, 
They still couldn't accept her. And Jesus responded, not directly to the guests, but by saying to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I don't think Jesus whispered that line. I think Jesus announced the healing that occurred in her life loudly for everyone to hear. I think Jesus said, you are welcome in my presence. You're forgiven. Go in peace. And for a woman known for her sin, what an incredible moment that must have been. Her sin was public. Everyone knew about it. And now at the feet of Jesus, she was publicly forgiven and restored. She was given the greatest gift someone could give her. Her self-esteem, her self-respect, her worth, and her value were restored. Her past was forever erased at the feet of Jesus. And from that point on, when someone wanted to condemn her, she had a reference point. She could say, hey, don't you remember? I bowed at the feet of Jesus and in front of the whole town, he announced I was forgiven. I used to be that person you're talking about, but that's not me anymore. I have been set free and I am forever free. I am a new person. Jesus proclaimed it, so it has to be true. I have been forgiven. She started out with the hope If only I could see Jesus. But she didn't just see Jesus. She had a life-changing encounter. And for the first time in her life, she knew what it was to be fully accepted, loved, and forgiven. She didn't look like a good candidate for forgiveness. But still she came. She came in a prostitute, an outcast. She left forgiven. She came in unclean. She left clean. So here's my question. What's your excuse? What's keeping you from relationship with Jesus? What is it that's keeping you from just coming to him honestly, no disguise, and risking everything to experience his love? You may have the same fears and questions as that woman. Rejection. What if I'm not good enough for God? Change, how can I ever change? Uh, What will I have to change? Criticism, what will people say? They'll all know what I've done, that I've messed up again. Fear, what if it doesn't work? Shame, how could God accept me? But just like the woman in the story, Jesus' response to your fear and questions is acceptance and forgiveness. You might be the most unlikely person to be in church and follow Jesus. Perfect. You're exactly who we prayed for. Jesus loves everyone, even unlikely people. And there's a place for you with Jesus. And there's a place for you with us. Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to pray for you today. If, if you have a past and you're struggling to get past the past, maybe you fear rejection. Maybe you're dealing with shame from what happened. Maybe something in your past is defining your future. And you say, Pastor Rod, I'm ready to finally be free of that. I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? We're going to pray right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Would you do one more thing? I I, I don't want to embarrass you. But if you raise your hand, would you just stand up right where you're at? And we're going to pray for you. I'm not going to make you come to the front. We're just going to pray for you right where you are. Because Jesus accepts you. And if there's somebody near you standing, would you stand with them? Put your hand on their shoulder or put your arm around them. And we're going to pray together. And uh, the reason why I want somebody to come pray with you is because I want you to feel our acceptance, even as Jesus accepts you. We don't look at you and attach labels. 
We don't judge you or condemn you because of your past. And the reason we've made the decision not to is because Jesus made that decision long ago. He made the decision to accept you. And we ratify his decision today. Now the people stand with you are going to pray. I'm going to pray. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that no one is disqualified from your love and from your acceptance. Thank you, Jesus, that everyone is welcome with you. Thank you for the story of a woman who everyone said shouldn't be there, but you looked at her with compassion and with love and forgiveness, and you announced to a whole town that she was forgiven and accepted and clean and could go in peace. Lord, I pray for people who are standing in this room, people who are watching at home, that shame from past mistakes is keeping them from moving forward. They're struggling with uh, how they ever get beyond this. Lord, we accept your decision about our past. And your decision about our past is it's forgiven and we're clean and we can go in peace. And so I pray you would help them instead of listening to other people, instead of the self-condemnation, everything they've heaped on themselves, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to accept the decision you already made. You made the decision to accept. You made the decision to forgive. You made the decision to include. You made the decision that they were good enough to be in your presence. And so I pray right now that you would give people the capacity to accept your picture of them instead of their own or others and to receive your forgiveness and your peace and your grace. Lord, we admit we've done wrong. It's not that we're saying that we haven't messed up, but we receive your forgiveness and we just come to you and thank you that there's room for everyone with you. We receive that forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. Aren't you glad God forgives? Yes. Amen.